1 over square root of 1 plus c. And to get the formula I wanted, you needed to have this less than 1, which is a true statement. But you need to prove it. Okay, just telling it uh, it's less than 1 because it's less than 1 is not enough. Okay, so remember to do that. You need to do the inequality itself. It's easy, I mean, we have done it to just uh, start with 1 plus c, bigger than 1, the inverse is less than 1, take the square roots and justify every step. So that was one remark. Oh, the other thing uh, about proof, some people are still uh, starting with their conclusion. So don't do that. I mean, okay, when you are doing on your scratch paper, you, it's, it's okay to start seeing what the conclusion looks like and why the conclusion is true. But when you write your proof formally, start with your hypothesis and go down to your conclusion. Okay, otherwise you get confused and uh, you don't know anymore what's, uh, what's your hypothesis and what's your conclusion and uh, so uh, be careful about uh, just the writing technique. Okay, I forgot my review. Uh, does anyone have a... Thank you. So let's go over the review. So let's use the inequality which we have for a plus h and a instead of x and y. Why do we do that? Well, because we want to show differentiability. So we need to compare f of a plus h to f of a and then divide by h. So uh, we get f of a plus h minus f of a over h less than h squared over absolute value of h. Okay, I'm dividing both sides by absolute value of h, so my inequalities are OK. Now, uh, the thing is, this h squared is also absolute value of h squared. So I end up with absolute value of h here. Okay, uh, do you see it? I mean, this is the same as absolute value of h to the square, then the absolute value of h cancels, and I end up with this. In any case, this is a positive quantity. I cannot end up with h, which could be positive or negative. OK, so this looks good because uh, we are going to use the squeezing theorem. And uh, we are going to say the following. Well, take now, take hn going to 0 and hn always different from 0. And let's use this with hn. We get f of a plus hn minus f of a over hn uh, less than uh, hn. Uh, this is positive, of course, because this is an absolute value. So this goes to 0. And this goes to 0 by hypothesis. I mean, because hn goes to 0. And then we are taking absolute value of hn, which goes to absolute value of 0. Okay, That's a property we have seen uh, several times already. Therefore, by the squeezing principle, uh, f of a plus hn minus f of a over hn converges to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay, So every time hn goes to 0, we get this, which means that the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h is 0, and which means that f prime exists. And 
f prime of a is zero. So what can I say about the function f? It's differentiable. OK. Constant. It's a constant function. So that's kind of an interesting result. You impose a, a condition which doesn't look that dramatic a priori. You, you just say, OK, I want this to happen. Yeah, I want this to happen for every x and y. So you, you are just asking for the distance between f of x and f of y to decrease like the square of x minus y. Well, the only function that has this property is a constant function. Of course, for, for constant functions, we see it works because we would have 0 on this side and x minus y squared on this side. So this is a true inequality. But what's remarkable here is that it's the only function that has this property. Okay? Anything else is not going to, to work. Uh, it's, it's not going to have this property. Questions on the method of proof? So to show differentiability, you don't have a lot of uh, ways. You need to do f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And you need to let hn be a sequence going to 0. And that's, yes? Well, we've proven that the derivative of a constant function is 0. Have we proven that, all, that because 0 is the derivative, the function is necessarily constant? That's yes. That's, that's one of the consequences of a mean value term. Because if you know that your derivative is 0, you see, you take. You, take, you know that f prime is 0 on your open interval i. You take x and y in i. You use the mean value term on i. And you know that you have a c, so that this is true. But this is 0. So f of x is equal to f of y. So for all x and y, f of x is equal to f of y. That's, that's how you know you have a constant function. So number two, we define a function piecewise. And first question, uh, let's uh, show that f is continuous at any a different from 0. Well, if a is positive, then there is a delta. Uh, such that a minus delta, a plus delta, is included in the positive numbers. Okay, graphically you have your zero here, your a is here, and you can find always an interval around a which is entirely in the positive side. Just take delta equal to a over two, for instance. So you know you can place yourself entirely on the positive side. Uh, if x belongs to a minus delta a plus delta, uh, then according to our definition, f of x is x. So on the interval a minus delta a plus delta, your function f is the polynomial x. Okay? And because continuity is a local property that depends only on what happens locally around a, you are done. Okay, what you're going to say is since 
the function x is continuous at A, so is F. Okay? Now, you do exactly the same thing for negative A. You say, well, if A is negative, then you find a delta such that A minus delta, A plus delta is entirely in the negative side this time. This time you take delta equal to minus A over 2. And this time, uh, for x in a minus delta a plus delta, you get that f of x is equal to x squared. <coughs> and since polynomials are continuous, F is continuous at A. Okay? That's because my function is locally a polynomial on both sides. The problem comes when we want to look at zero. So, second question, show that the F is continuous at zero. Well, if you take zero, then it doesn't matter what you take for delta, you're always going to go both ways. And you need to use both quantities. You see, your, if x is negative, you are going to get that f of x is x squared. If x is positive, you are going to get that f of x is x. You cannot say that this is a polynomial. It's not. on 0 minus delta 0 plus delta. It doesn't matter what, how small your delta is. You are always going to have two different uh, uh, versions of f here, which is a big difference with what happens there. So you need to do a little more work. So what you're going to do is say, well, let's take xn going to 0. And let's try to show that f of xn goes to f of 0. Okay, so xn goes to zero. Well, f of xn, again, I'm in trouble because f of xn is either xn squared or xn. I don't know which. However, they are both going to zero. So it's not very difficult to, to show that this thing goes to zero. Uh, there are several ways to do that. We can. You can say the following. You can say that uh, uh, there is n, so that if n is bigger than capital N, xn is less than 1. Why can I say that? xn goes to 0. So I'm using convergence, definition of convergence of a sequence with epsilon equal 1. That's what I'm doing. Why is it useful to, to remind that? Well, then f of xn, which is xn or xn squared, is always less than, or let's put up some values here, you get this, or this, is always less than, so which one is the highest 
is 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 the the upper bound. Which one is the biggest one of these two quantities? X n. Any other opinion? If you, if we are taking someone less than one, it's x n squared. The square of a number less than one is smaller. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, it's smaller, but what I want is bigger. You are right. Thank you. So we know that it's less than x n, correct? Therefore, we use the squeezing theorem again, where this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and therefore f of x n must go to zero. But zero is precisely what we wanted. Zero is f of zero. So f is continuous at zero. OK? Because our definition. So there are two definitions of continuity that you need to memorize. The first one, every time x, a, xn goes to a, f of xn must go to f of a for f to be continuous at a. Second definition, with the epsilon and delta. OK? You need, depending on what the problem is, you, mean, you may need one definition or the other one. Third question, is f differentiable at zero? <laughs> well, here to, to look at uh, the graph helps. You would have x squared here, and then something like this. So it's clearly not differentiable at zero. So once you know that, uh, you can work with sequences. It's not very uh, difficult. So we want to show that So what we want to show is that the limit of a plus h minus f of a over h, well, it's a is 0 in this case. This limit has no limit as h goes to 0. Okay, That's what we want. So we take uh, hn equal to 1 over n, and we see that we get one, f of 1 over n, f of 0 is 0 over 1 over n. And uh, f of 1 over n for 1. So it's just 1 over n over 1 over n. So this converges to 1. And then we take another sequence, kn. Of course, we are going to take something that approaches from the left. And we do the same thing, f of kn over kn. You see what I'm, why I'm doing this? It's because it simplifies, right? f of 0 is 0. That's why I end up with f of h over h. That's the quantity which is of interest. So f of kn in this case would be uh, 1 over n squared over minus 1 over n. That's minus 1 over n, and that converges to 0. So we, ha we have taken two different sequences, both going to 0, that give me different limits. Therefore, the limit does not exist. Okay, number three, uh, actually the first two questions are not really related to uh, what you'll be tested on, but it cannot hurt to do them. Uh, 
so we know that the AN is positive and by operation on limits we know that A is going to be positive if it's the limit of a positive sequence. Okay, so that's really not much to do here. B, square root of An converges to square root of A. Well, you either pretend that, you, that we have shown that already, that the function square root of x is continuous, and you say square root of x is continuous, therefore square root of An goes to square root of A, or you prove it because we haven't done it yet. So let's, let's do it, uh, it will be done. Uh, so how do you show that square root of a n converges to square root of a? Well, you, uh, you just do an epsilon uh, proof for that. And actually, I think the proof is slightly different if a is zero or not. So let's do two cases. Uh, first one, a is zero. And therefore, we have a n going to 0. And then uh, what will we need? We'll need, we'll need to end up with square root of a n uh, less than epsilon. So we'll need to, to start with a n less than epsilon squared. That's what we want. Okay, so uh, this is on our scratch paper, and now we uh, write it because since so uh, since a n goes to zero, I know that there is a capital N, so that if n is bigger than capital N, then a n minus zero is less than epsilon square. Okay, just write the definition of uh, convergence to zero with epsilon square instead of epsilon. Now this thing here is a n, because we are assuming that a n is a positive sequence. So we get a n less than epsilon square, and therefore square root of a n is less than square root of epsilon square. And we can do that because square root is an increasing function. That's why we don't change the sign here. And this is epsilon because epsilon is a positive number. But remember that when you do square root of a square, you may get a or minus a, depending whether a is positive or not. So this proves, in this case, so what we get is square root of an minus zero less than epsilon, and this proves square root of an goes to zero. Now, second case, a is a strictly positive number, and uh, so this time, Yeah, uh, this time what we want, so let's again on, on our scratch paper we would say well what we want is square root of a n minus square root of a less than epsilon. Uh, we multiply by the conjugate expression and we get a n minus a over square root of a n plus square root of a less than epsilon. Uh, however, Uh, if we have, yeah, we, we can note the following that a n minus a over square root of a is going to be bigger than, yeah, is going to be bigger than uh, a n minus a over square root of a plus square root of a n. Okay, that's because I'm dividing by something bigger here. So I get something smaller. And uh, uh, it's enough to have that this is less than epsilon in order to get what we want. Because this is square root of an minus square root of a. 
So you see where I need my, to know whether my A is zero or not. If A is zero, I cannot do this. That's, that's why we have two cases. Anyway, so this is on scratch paper. Now we do the formal proof. We say, well, uh, for every epsilon, there exists an n so that a n minus a is less than epsilon square root a. Okay. okay, we can do that. This is a valid epsilon. It's a positive number. Now, what we say is then uh, a n, okay, so then we do square root of a n minus square root of a is equal to a n minus a over square root of a n plus square root of a, which is itself less than a n minus a over square root of a which is less than epsilon square root of a over square root of a, which is epsilon. And so we are done. So the, the scratch paper computation tells me what I should put here, okay, the type of manipulation I'm doing. Again, this is not going to be on the test. I mean, we. This is, uh, we are not really going to compute limit of sequences uh, in, uh, in this test. Could be in the final form. But, um, so, and anyway, it's an important result because uh, of a conclusion, which is in C. If a n goes to a, then uh, square root of a n goes to square root of a. That's what we just proved. Therefore, g, which is defined by g of x equals square root of x, is continuous on the positive numbers. Yeah, everything here must be on the positive numbers. My, uh, my sequence a n, my a, otherwise the function is not defined. Okay, questions? So uh, let's go on with number four. Okay, in order to define square root of f, we need to know that f is strictly positive. Okay. So we take f of a to be strictly positive, and we know that f is continuous at a. We define epsilon to be equal f of a over 2, and by continuity, There is a delta such that if x minus a is less than delta, then f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon, which is f of a over 2. Therefore, f of x is between f of a minus epsilon and f of a plus epsilon. Because of our choice of epsilon, this is f of a over 2, which is a strictly positive number. So f is strictly positive on uh, a minus delta, a plus delta. Okay, so in this type of situation, this is where the second definition of continuity is important because it gives you useful inequalities. Now, if f is positive, then square root of f 
is well defined on a minus delta a plus delta. It may not be elsewhere, right? It may drop to a negative value and then you cannot talk about the square root of f. And your delta may be very small, but it exists and you have, even if it's a very small interval, you can define your function near a. B So how do we know that square root of f is a continuous function? At a, how do we know that uh, square root of f is continuous at a? It's differentiable. I'm sorry? It's differentiable at a, so that implies you touch the difference. Well, you, you don't know that square root of f is uh, differentiable, really. So what, what would you use to prove that G is continuous? Composition. Composition of continuous functions. Right? You can write this as being square root with F well, square root of uh, is this, and so S is continuous at f of a, because f of a is a, is a positive number, and f is continuous at a. So by composition of continuous functions, Square root of f is continuous at a. So for number five, you have a function which is continuous on the closed bound on interval AB, differentiable on AB open. And what else do you know? You know that um, G of A is equal to G of B. And you know that there is a C, so that G of C is strictly less than G of A and G of B. And we want to show that there is x0 in AB so that g prime of x0 is 0. Huh. So how do you answer that? How do you find x0 so that g prime of x0 is 0? Rho's theorem is a good idea. Uh, Rho's theorem. tells you that there is a C in AB such that G prime of C is zero. But remember before invoking the term to check the hypothesis, G is continuous at uh, AB closed, thank you, and differentiable on A, B, open. Okay, so uh, to, to strictly answer this question, we just say this and we're done. Now, we can get more information about this C. Uh, oh, it's not C. C has been used here. So it's X
What other theorem can I use in a case like that? The mean value, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what about the extreme value term? Yeah. What what hypothesis do I need to use the extreme value term? Yeah. I only need continuity on a closed and bounded interval. Okay, so. What we know is that by the extreme value term, uh, there is uh, well the, the max and mean and minimum are attained. I know that. And uh, I know that uh, the minimum in particular cannot be at A or B. It cannot because I know that uh, there is at least one point where I go below the value at A and B. Okay, so uh, the minimum does not occur. at A or B. So it must occur in A, B open. Now, when an extreme occurs in an open interval, what can I say about the derivative? It's zero. Okay, so it must occur in A B, and and we 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 will have uh, g prime of x one equal to zero if the minimum occurs at x1. So really, the question I wanted to ask when I, uh, I wrote this was show that uh, you have a minimum and that the derivative is 0 at that minimum. So you, you can get a lot more because, of course, here when you're using Rolle's theorem, you're not using this hypothesis here. So, um, So you look at uh, uh, the solution, this equation, and you ask to show that you have at least one solution. What do you use to show that you have at least one solution? Intermediate value term. So you define your polynomial P as x cubed plus x plus 1. What hypothesis must hold in order to use the intermediate value term? Continuity. So you know that the polynomial P is continuous everywhere. Then what else do you do to, to use the intermediate value term to solve this? Yes. So P of 0, for instance, is, is 1. And p of minus 1 is minus 1. So by the intermediate value term, 
we know that there exists a solution in minus 1, in 0, minus 1. Okay. Of course, cubic uh, polynomials don't all have the same shape, unlike uh, 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 parabolas. And you may have the case of x cubed, where you cross only once, or you may be crossing three times and having a different shape. So what would be the generalization of, uh, of A? How can we generalize this, this uh, result? So we are talking about uh, solutions of uh, equations. How can we have a more general result that ensures that we have at least one solution? Yeah, we could generalize like this. We could say any out polynomial, any polynomial with highest power odd has at least one word. We would write our polynomial as being x to the k plus uh, a constant here, x to the k minus 1 plus a0, for instance. Why can I choose to take a constant equal to 1 here as my first? Yes, I'm looking for an equation equal to 0. I don't know what I have here, but I could divide everything by this, and I'll get a 1. So k is odd. Now, how would the argument go? Uh, continuity is OK, because p, any polynomial is continuous. Yes. So how can you show that you get both positive and negative values? But maybe all, all your other coefficients are negative. Right. As x increases to infinity or to negative infinity, what's the most important term in this polynomial? It's x to the k. Okay, x to the k is going to impose its limit because at, after a while, it's much bigger than everything else here. So that's how you know that when x goes to positive infinity, you are going to go to positive infinity. And when x goes to negative infinity, this will go to negative infinity. And 0 is in between. So you can use your intermediate value term. But to formally write it, it requires some work. OK, but that's the idea. The idea is because it's an outpower, at positive infinity, it goes to positive infinity. At negative infinity, it goes to negative infinity. And therefore, I must have negative values and positive values. OK, 7.
so this is a continuous function on well actually I can minus one positive infinity and it's differentiable on minus one positive infinity. How, how would I justify these claims that it's continuous and differential? Why would it be continuous everywhere? Because it's the third root, which means it can have positive and negative values. Yeah, you could define it everywhere. But uh, 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 we, we have talked about n fruits on the positive side. So that you know, you have the same thing for positive, for odd and even roots. Composition and addition of functions. Yeah, you can just compose these two, and you get the result. You get that uh, one plus x to a one third uh, is the composition of. Okay, so by composition of <coughs> continuous and differentiable functions, we, we, we get that it's continuous and differentiable. Uh, there is a problem at minus one in terms of differentiability. That's why we exclude this point, because when you take the derivative, you end up with one over one plus x over two thirds, and that's not going to be differentiable uh, at uh, at minus one. So you get uh, we we can use a mean value theorem uh, by doing f of x minus f of zero equal to f prime of c times x. So f of x is one plus x to one third minus one. Uh, F prime of x is, by the chain rule, one third uh, one plus x to the minus two thirds. So I'm going to put a c here. Times x. So we end up with 1 plus c. So c is uh, strictly between 0 and x. And x is positive. c is between 0 and x. So 1 plus c is certainly bigger than 1. And then 1 over 1 plus c is less than 1. And when we put this to two thirds, we get this, and that's because this is an increasing function, because it's a positive power. Therefore, we can get rid of our inequality uh, by just it's less than one, and we get that one third one over one plus c to the two thirds times x is less than x over three, and so this gives us one plus x 
over 1 third minus 1 is less than x over 3, and 1 plus x to 1 third is less than 1 plus x over 3. So what would be the generalization of uh, this inequality? We did it for half. We did it for one third. Uh, what else? Yeah, or even uh, more generally, 1 plus x to the r is going to be less than 1 plus rx but for which r and which x? r between 0 and 1, right? Because here we have used that our power Well, certainly here it's important to have uh, r positive because we're multiplying by r to get this. Okay, so our r should be positive, should be less than one. Uh, it should be less than one for this inequality here to work, because then r minus one, when you take the derivative, is a negative power, and you get this. Question. Mm -hmm. The problem actually says less than or equal to. Would it just all you need to do is just change it between the zero and the zero? Um, you, you, if you take if x equals zero is allowed, then you need a large inequality. But if uh, x is strictly positive, then it's a strict inequality. But what I'm saying is, this, it says to prove it as it is not a strict inequality. That's right. That's because x equals 0 is allowed in this case. But if you get rid of x equals 0, then it is a strict inequality. The, 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 the only place where it would change is here. You are multiplying by something that could be 0, and so you need to change your inequality here to a large inequality. That's all. Otherwise, uh, if x is strictly positive, so this is assuming that x is strictly positive, you, that you get a strict inequality. Okay, other questions? So remember to uh, check your hypothesis before using a term, okay? And memorize the definitions and the terms. Okay, so let's stop here if you don't have any questions. I'm sorry? That's basically just